Thanks for joining us on What's Hiding in Your Software, How S-Bombs Reduce Supply Chain Risk. I'm George Calavantes, and I head up operations at Industrial Defender, and I'm joined today by Eric Byers and Jeremy Morgan. May the fourth be with you guys. Thanks, George. It's a real pleasure to be here and with all you people out there. Um, those of you who don't know me, I'm the CEO of Adolis Technology, or you probably know me from the Tofino Security Firewall, um, and you've probably seen those out in your industrial plants. Um, and with me uh, as well as George is Jeremy. Thanks, Eric. Uh, my name is Jeremy Morgan. I'm the Principal Risk and Solutions Consultant at Industrial Defender. Um, I have 20 years of IT and OT and various experience in various roles from the asset owner and compliance program manager side, running through audits and uh, representing my company for standards drafting meetings all the way through to uh, OEM cybersecurity commissioning engineer, uh, product manager delivering patch and vulnerability services for an OEM, and then uh, working in the OT cybersecurity solutions vendor space. George, will you take us away? Yep. Hey, we have an exciting agenda today, and we've mixed in some levity. We're going to take you through why collecting asset information or OTS information is very difficult, how do you go about collecting OTS information, cybersecurity automation best practices, and then we're really going to get into the vulnerability challenge and how SBOMs, uh, what are and what are SBOMs and how they can help me. Uh, we're going to end with key takeaways and some questions. So before we get into the SBOM conversation, we have to accurately collect OTS information. And the collection of information is not as easy as many believe it should be. So how did we get here? In the old days, most of us manually audit our OT environments. I don't want to date myself, but many years ago when the concepts of PSPs and ESPs were just starting to be accepted, I took it upon myself to audit the SCADA EMS system, both via a network map and a spreadsheet. The simple task started out with one spreadsheet tab and an 11 by 17 Visio schematic and ended up with multiple tabs and having the schematic have to be printed on a distribution feeder map. I did my best. I documented every port connection, OS level, and device. I was proud of myself, but what I learned quite quickly is that even static OT environments change more often than not. And if you want to understand your deployment, you cannot use manual tools to produce accurate information, especially if the deliverable and timetable is not defined. Once we discovered that manual collection would not provide an accurate picture, we moved along to Windows and Linux scripting. We may have even tried our hands at creating relational databases. When that failed, we probably moved along to enterprise tools, only to discover that they were great for Windows and Linux, but did not cover the remaining assets in our environment, which led us to the need for specialized OT tools. I actually have a demo of someone famous trying to audit her OT assets. So here's Princess Leia. You may know her. She's the Princess of Alderaan and member of the Imperial Senate. It's not her day job to audit the assets on Tantive 4 but she's going to give it a try. Let's see what happens during her audit. Oops. Oh. oh, sorry about that. Well, like all audits, they have a little problem. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Okay. We, we knew eventually it was going to work out. <laughs> so, so let's go to the next slide. So again, why is OT asset collection hard? And how much best guard do you need to actually act to accurately collect OTS information. Not a lot, but you need to have a broad approach to data collection. Now, the reason it's still hard is that enterprise asset collection tools deprecate software support faster than OT systems become end of life. Now, this is very important. One of Industrial Defender's taglines is that we speak dead languages. So it's very important for us to maintain legacy OS and legacy protocol support. In fact, it was really a hard conversation for Industrial Defender to have a few years ago when we had to deprecate Windows NT support. And that just shows you how serious the issue of supporting OT asset collection is, is that you have to maintain legacy protocol or legacy OS support way beyond when Microsoft removes uh, support for those OSs. And then now, you know, a lot of the enterprise operation is moving uh, to the cloud. Well, it would make sense that those enterprise asset information collection tools are also migrating to the cloud. Uh, in some cases, the asset management or asset inventorying uh, collection tools are also very resource heavy, and that impacts operations on legacy systems that may not have you know, 16 threads and hyper-threading available to them still. Uh, in some cases, SCADA 
and DCS vendor applications are not visible to typical software identification applications. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, individuals out there that have deployed HMI software via tarballs, and that doesn't end up in the registry typically. We also know that OTS is connected via different mediums, via unidirectional gateways or serial connections. And then sometimes OTS is just communicate in information via their OT specific protocols. So how do you go about collecting uh, asset information? You, have, you need to have a lot of tools or a lot of arrows in your quiver per se. Uh, in some cases where it's available to you, you should embed agents or if you can embed agents, there it benefits you greatly. You, it pulls back the most comprehensive data set. Uh, it's easy to manage centrally and typically there's no credentials required, central cred credentials required to extract that information. Now, of course, the con is it requires the installation resources on endpoints and many DCS gate vendors do have warranty implications with installing software other than their DCS gate application. We then go to agentless and native querying. Uh, the pros behind that is it's the second most comprehensive data collection method. This is the same method that an engineer, an engineer would use to pull back engineering information, uh, users, firewall rules, the same mechanism that you do to Telnet or SSH into a switch or a firewall, you can still leverage to pull back OTS information uh, if you have the right credentials. And this also can be done via centralized data collection methodology. And in some cases, if the vendor supports uh, integration with a password auto repository, you can also centrally manage the passwords required uh, to interrogate those devices. Now, the cons for something like this is it does require routable connections to all of your device and credentials. So in some cases, you may be opening up ports that you didn't want to in the beginning in order to extract that information. And then, of course, passive has been in the news a lot lately, and it's a great tool to have uh, in your bag of tricks. In the case of network monitoring, all it takes, it's quickly, it's quick to deploy. You can quickly find IP-based assets. And of course, many of the vendors today layer in a certain aspect of threat intel. Now, the cons obviously is that you do have to deploy hardware or you do have to enable uh, span ports and mirror ports. And sometimes legacy architecture doesn't enable uh, those types of newer techniques to be deployed in said uh, implementation. Now, of course, it's also a limited data set and it may require multiple sensors. So there is you know, an investment required to pull back information passively. And then of course, at, at, the, at the tail end, if you have offline collection uh, methodologies, you can pull back information from serial and air-gapped assets. Uh, you can process configuration files. Of course, the con for that is the, you're only as good as the last copy of data you receive from that endpoint. So, you know, at the tail end, if you have embedded agents, if you have a centralized approach to agentless or remote access uh, interrogation, if you have passive monitoring or the ability to also collect information uh, via air gap methodologies, that's everything it's going to take for you to pull back a truer depiction of what your OT environment looks like. It's it's not simple, but it's also not hard if you explore all of the possibilities. Uh, and all the tools necessary for that type of an engagement. Thanks, George. I think we're gonna head into a poll right now. Um, while we're doing the poll, uh, I think we should go ahead and answer a couple questions that came in. Um, so let me, Eric, I think the first one should be for you. Uh, what can people do to prepare for supply chain attacks like solar winds? Well, um, you know, this is really the discussion today. Um, the thing about the SolarWinds attack is it's probably unlikely that anybody in this industry is going to be able to look inside uh, SolarWinds, the company, and be able to detect that information. Um, what we need to be able to do is respond quickly when uh, the news of such a, a supply chain attack uh, happens um, or is, is disclosed. And this has been really interesting. I was just on a Canadian intelligence briefing a few weeks ago, and what uh, the Canadian intelligence agencies were saying is that they are still getting utilities reporting they've discovered solar winds. What do they do about it? Um, and so this is the real risk here. 
Uh, well, there's two real risks. One is, of course, the attack, but the second is, can we respond quickly? And that, I think, is really what is reachable right now um, with the techniques we're going to talk about today. Um, the asset detection, and then once you have the assets, understanding what's running on those assets using SBOMs. So we'll cover that a little bit more in a bit. And then real quick before we get jump into the poll results, uh, we'll, um, George, maybe for you, can I get a complete software inventory with just a network monitoring or passive solution? You cannot get a complete software inventory using a passive monitoring uh, solution. You can only leverage what the assets uh, will report through that passive monitoring technology. Windows assets do not report via passive technologies, so it doesn't give you 100% uh, software inventory coverage. Yeah, and we saw that we saw that too when we did the S4 um, Bake Offs a couple of years ago. Um, there was just lots of assets that just were not discoverable because they're hidden behind uh, serial uh, gateways. Um, it's it's a useful technique, but it sure doesn't solve the whole world. Exactly, and at the end, remember it's only what's communicating. That's why a lot of passive monitoring vendors also have to deploy you know, soft active technology where they send out. Uh, a small byte string in order to have assets that are on the network but not communicating report up. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, yep. And also, just to answer the question, uh, someone asked about will slides and the recording be available? And yes, both both will be available um, after the presentation. Um, and now we're going to talk really quickly about the poll results. So, uh, not surprising, 61% was manual, 17% uh, was active, 6% was agentless, and 17% had passive. Yep. And that was uh, for the primary asset collection method, and that's that's not surprising. I'm not I'm not surprised to see 61% manual. Still, neither am I, Jeremy. No, neither am I. All right. So, at this point, some of you may be thinking, like, what does all of this have to do with S bombs? I came here to see S bombs, yep. um, and some of you might be wondering why you're looking at uh, something that looks like. Pink Floyd's lesser known album, Dark Side of the PLC. Um, and what we wanted to talk about was because SBOMs are, are, are like many modern problems. Uh, they're a data and process issue. And as shown by our poll results, uh, they're a people issue, right? I mean, you're doing 60% manual collection, that's gonna have an impact on your ability to uh, you know, leverage SBOMs to their fullest extent. Um, I'm not surprised um, you know, that the answer was 60%. Um, I would say 60 to 70%. And I think the fact that we have a lot of utility people on, on the line probably moves that to even, you know, um, you know, a lower number than it might otherwise be. If I were to go into manufacturing, I'd probably guess closer to 80 or 90 percent would have said that. Um, you know, but unfortunately, manual manual is OK and it'll help you meet some of your NERCSIP compliance requirements. Uh, but you can't stay there uh, because Eric, as he's about to definitely show us here in a minute, uh, the complexity level is just exponential in our world. And uh, this is yet another area where decades of, of, of the lifespan of an asset doesn't do us any favors. Um, Eric, Eric will show that in a, in a really good first example about how multiple owners over a single asset can really have an impact here. Um, so, you know, just to kind of circle back to what George just covered and the pyramid you're looking at, um, the fundamentals of cybersecurity haven't changed in the last 20 or 30 years, right? They're ingrained in every framework from ISO 27001 to NERCSIP to NIST to the CIS 20 to 62443. And it's simply like what you see here on the screen, which is you need to know what your assets are. You need to know what runs on them. You need to know what accounts have access to them, right? Like you need to know who they're talking to. And then you take this and you establish this and you, you form baselines around this. You, you, you form operating patterns around this. And then you start to manage that. And when you get all this into structured data and you get it into a platform that can automate this, then you can start to really manage this in near real time and, and start to have some success. And then once you have that data and only once you have all that data and that foundation to ensure that data is well, then this turns into a big data problem. And then you can start leveraging things like analytics and automatic vulnerability monitoring and reporting on this stuff and and like and threat intelligence right like you cannot absorb threat intelligence from people if you don't know how to read the threat intelligence that imply it to your environment right if i get i could get 9000 indicators of compromise but if i have no idea how to apply that to my specific operating environment because i don't have the underlying data it does me no good right and 
you know, so like, again, it's just the fundamental thing that's really changed is just the automation and the speed at which everything's happening. You know, kids and hacktivists and organized crime and nation states, they've all automated. So we have to do it on the defensive side as well. Um, you know, and uh, so ultimately what this slide is saying is that you must build a cybersecurity program on the fundamentals and you have to get that automated and into structured systems that can use that data to solve these issues because there aren't any more people to do this. I was listening to uh, Recorded Future yesterday and they were talking to someone from, from uh, Booz Allen and uh, the cybersecurity uh, is around 0% unemployment. I mean, all of you know this, any of you in leadership positions, when you tried to hire, all of you know this, right? Um, you know, it's it's a buyer's market. I mean, it's it's an employee's market for cybersecurity positions. So automation is really our, our only hope. And not only that, that's not the only reason to automate. The other reason to automate is, um, you know, you just, you need, to, you're, you need your analysts doing higher level work, right? Like running around, collecting data and putting that into spreadsheets. That does not make anyone feel engaged. It it doesn't use their talents to the best of their ability, and it, and and you know then they'll shortly leave you, right? If that's all you have them doing. So automation is about retaining that great and talent investment and letting them leverage their cybersecurity skills where they're really needed, um, and not on the day to day mundane. So once you have that data, what can you do? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can start to do things like uh, so. See you here. Some you can do some simple risk scoring, right? So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but there's just some things you can do once you start to automate your data collection. You can get access to near real-time risk scoring. And then you can, and because you collect so much, if you collect, the more data you collect, the more fine-tuned you can make those risk scores, right? Like so, and you can tune them to your view of the world and your organization's need. Uh, next slide, please, Eric. And then kind of the other thing you can start to do here is, uh, you know, so this shows vulnerability. And I want to talk for a minute about this. Um, so without automation, this level of detail, uh, even for a single site, requires a full-time FTE or maybe even a team of FTEs to collect the current state. Um, you have to go to each, you have to go to each asset. You got to collect that data. Then you have to go to uh, each website, vendor's website for that data, because maybe they have stuff behind a secret, secret secure website. Uh, then you have to go to three or four public sources in order to cross-check what you have from the vendor's website, right? And uh, every vendor's not Microsoft, and they don't politely tell you that this is a security related, you know, vulnerability. Uh, most of them release whole versions and they bury it in the release notes like about eight pages deep. Um, so you have to read through all of that information. So it really starts to add up in a lot of manual analysis and processing time. Um, and while some in our, in our industry might be arguing that patching should be a low priority, none of those people, none of them, at least I hope not, are saying you should not do this analysis to make, your sh make yourself aware of these risks, right? You cannot protect yourself from that which you are not aware, right? And then you have to put all of this into a database or a spreadsheet and just pivot table the crap out of it, right? So, you know, I used to help with a control system. I used to help do the cybersecurity for it. And uh, this was the job of six people who did this every month. And we could scale because we were an OEM and we had hundreds of sites around in the world. Many of our customers had one right like it's not cost effective for them to do this by themselves um and so the point here isn't to provide you know it's not fear uncertainty doubt like like th these are real things uh it's not an unsolvable problem there are solutions out there to help you with this this is merely to highlight the complexity of doing this and why s bombs are critical to our future but also why automation of s bomb data analysis is also key um, and now eric's going to dive more deeply into this topic and the complexity it brings yeah, thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, why OT vulnerability management is hard. Vulnerability management anywhere is hard, um, but over the last four years, I've been spending a lot of time looking at OT vulnerabilities, and they're one end, never ending surprise. And um, without, um, I'll give you some examples why, but without automation behind you, you are really going to wear your team to bits. But there are solutions, and I'll explain those in a second. Um, so before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about advisories and CVEs and portals and CPEs. So say, for example, this notice up here uh, that is up on the CISA site, it's an ICS advisory, uh, not that long ago, just, just last year. Um, and um, it says that this is what's effective, Flexera. Um, okay, well, now, do we have Flexera on our plan? You know, that's not an obvious question because you'll also notice that it says integrated into many products, but what products? 
Uh, there's no clue in this notice on whether your products, the ones you're using, um, are impacted. Um, the advice gets a little worse. Contact the product's vendor support team. What vendor? <laughs> Do you contact Flexera? You don't even know if you've got Flexera on your plant floor. Um, you know, so uh, the obvious thing to do is go and click on the National Vulnerability Database um, and start digging into what's called the CPEs, uh, Common Platform Enumeration. Now, the theory behind CPEs is that by looking at CPEs, you should know whether a vulnerability impacts you. But all you see here is Flexera. Well, wait a second. Um, why is this product, which, um, you know, nobody's ever seen a Flexera PLC out there um, because they don't exist. <laughs> why did this get to be an ICS environment uh, problem? Um, and the reason is, is because Flexera is buried deep inside ICS environments uh, as an ICS product. For example, Johnson Controls here. If you go directly to the Johnson Controls site, um, you can go and look up and they'll reference Flexera. Okay, so right now, um, the manual way to do this is not by looking uh, through CPEs, but uh, just going to every single portal for every single vendor you have and try and look up whether they've referenced Flexera. This is super inefficient. Um, so a lot of people say, well, let's just use the CPEs when it's obvious. So I don't know if many of you recognize this PLC out here, but it's a G Fanuc. Um, uh, RX3i, I used to have one sitting on my desk for the longest time. I know the box really well. I also know it's got a pile of vulnerabilities in it. Um, now, the obvious thing to do, if I wanna say search the National Vulnerability Database for um, vulnerabilities for this PLC, one would think I would search for GE or Fanuc. Um, but there's no single name for GE. Um, GE's got a lot of different names, and for that matter, so does Fanuc. It has a bunch of different names. So you know, there's a few things to uh, search. And then of course, they were a joint venture and that had multiple names. Um, I've seen uh, 30 to 40 different names for GE uh, Fanuc Automation. Um, then they renamed the whole thing GE Intelligent Platforms and started creating more names. Uh, then they got rid of Fanuc and uh, it became GE Intelligent Platforms. Um, and then they bought Alstrom and they became GE Automation and Controls. And then Emerson went along and bought this division off of GE and it became Emerson Electric, so you got more names. So, which name are you gonna search the National Vulnerability Database for? Well, I thought this would be a fun little project. So, I started searching for GE and Fanuc. Don't ever search the National Vulnerability Database for GE. I got uh, north of 130,000 hits. I basically locked up my browser. I had to shut my browser off. Um, I'm not sure what I did to the National Vulnerability Database, but it probably wasn't pretty. Um, probably there might have been a vulnerability in there, but at 130,000 hits, there's nothing I can do with it. So uh, I then started trying to do it, narrow it down. I tried GE, I tried GE, or GE Fanuc, I tried GE underscore Fanuc, I tried GE dash Fanuc, I tried uh, about 20 different, using some scripts, I tried 20 different uh, name combinations. I got nothing, zero. I found some stuff, yeah, I found some uh, simplicity stuff, but nothing to do with the PLC. Okay, let's try that again. Let's try GE Intelligent. Uh, tons and tons of hits, uh, but nothing to do with the PLC. Uh, try GE Automation, um, Dash Automation, Underscore Automation, GE Automation Limited, Inc., whatever. Keep trying, keep trying, nothing, nothing, nothing. I got happiness when I hit uh, Emerson, when I decided to search for Emerson. Now, unless the person doing these searches knows that Emerson had bought GE Fanuc, you're just out of luck. Um, so you can see that in order to find these, you're often forced to do hundreds and hundreds of searches uh, and then process thousands of results. This can only be done efficiently through uh, data science techniques. By the way, for a little grin, of course, I went over to the Industrial Control System database at uh, CISA and thought, well, now that I know it's Emerson, I should search for Emerson. Uh, no, that's the wrong answer. Uh, and G Fanuc is also the wrong answer. The right answer is G if you want to search uh, ICS cert. Um, and there is one of the vulnerabilities. Uh, sadly, uh, searching for uh, RX3i does not give you the second vulnerability because somebody had a typo. Um, so uh, interesting little thing that you have constantly, if you're going to try and search uh, advisors, you have to do it in an automated fuzzy 
uh, data science mechanism that understands the relationships of, between how software is bought and sold or companies are bought and sold. Um, the reality is, is that even if you do all that, 46% of one of the major OT vendors out there just simply don't list in the CVE database. You have to go to their website and you have to read PDFs. Uh, and um, when we do see CVE listings, for, they're for the software components and they don't actually reference the products at risk like we saw with Flexera. So the truth is, is CPE searches um, are useful but on their own, they're very, very limited, even with a little bit of uh, smart, uh, fuzzy searching. You have to do more than that. And the only way to do more than that is through what we call software bill of materials, or SBOMs. And, and this is um, basically like a recipe or an ingredients list. You go to the store, you buy a can of tomato soup, and listed on the side of the can of tomato soup is all the ingredients. That's the same thing for software. You can see here the start of an SBOM for uh, uh, GE Prophecy Machine Edition, and you can see that there's different companies supplying different components in here. There's a couple of uh, national standards that are coming out. Um, SPDX and Cyclone DX are two examples. Um, but the important thing to remember, and this is absolutely critical, an SBOM on its own is kind of useless. It's like reading a can of tomato soup and seeing that there is an ingredient called monosodium glucomate on the, in the ingredients and not having a clue whether that is good or bad, you have to be able to enrich your SBOMs in order to understand uh, what those ingredients mean. And that's absolutely critical. So I think at this point, we're going to do some more poll questions. Yeah, and while, while y'all are taking a poll. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. All right, well, for you guys. Oh, collision. <laughs> All right, <laughs> go for it there. I was just going to say, while you people are taking the polls, don't forget that you can also ask questions in the Q and A panel, um, and we'll be happy to answer them during stoppages. Yeah. And here, for Sorry. those of you, who do you think should be supplying those S bombs out there? Pick, pick your favorite. Has everybody clicked? I guess so. All right. And we got yeah, another so, poll. Here's the results. So, yeah, I was going to throw the results yeah. up real quick. Um, I know there are some OEM vendors on here, so uh, get ready, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then for, for uh, you know, George and myself and Eric, I, I think uh, the, the next highest response is, is definitely, uh, you know, in our, in our court, too. Yeah, absolutely. And no one, you know, no I, one wants I, the no one wants the government involved though. That's for sure. No, that's interesting. <laughs> that is fascinating. Somebody needs to tell the government. Um, that 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 is really interesting. And I feel you know I I was the chief technology officer at Belden, so you know it's a tier two decent size OEM supplier to all sorts of other OEMs. And I know it's hard to build those. So I, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, you know that it's this is not just something the vendors have to just do blindly it's and and there can be a lot of help out there um in fact that's one of the things i spend most of my time doing is helping uh vendors and and a good example of a vendor who's doing that is is on the call here with me today um we started off working with industrial fender to make sure that their software and their s bombs were really good um and helping them generate s bombs um and um, you know that's really where our relationship started. Um, and you see other vendors out there too, really great. Um, so let's go into another poll. Uh, you know, the S-bombs are possible. Uh, are you asking for them? Sure, and while everybody else is answering those, uh, answering the poll, uh, one of the questions that came in is, uh, do we value, do we validate the issuer of the patches as well as check the integrity? Wow, uh, that's I, a great yeah. question. 
So um, just, uh, you know, basically what uh, my company is doing is exactly that. Um, how do we uh, validate that the patches are uh, signed, properly signed, signed by somebody you want it to be signed with, signed the way they normally sign it, um, all the components in it, it makes sense. Um, all the components don't have vulnerabilities or if they have vulnerabilities, they're disclosed. Those are all the things you need to do with, with a software bundle to validate it from a supply chain point of view. And, and that's basically what um, my team and I work on data science to make sure that happens. Okay. Hey, let's see what we've got. Hey, great. It's good to see people are starting to ask for it. Um, that's excellent. Um, and it's unfortunate. I, I'm, I'm sad to see uh, number four, vendors are refused or can't provide. I'm, you know, there's absolutely tools out there that'll make it possible for vendors to do this. And again, um, Industrial Defender is a great example. Their software will generate S-bombs on uh, we'll analyze it and we that's how we started you know you see companies like um, uh, caterpillar solar turbines and uh, companies like osi soft all of them uh, doing a really good job on their s bombs um, it's absolutely possible all right let's move on like why bother <laughs> you know what will s bombs do for you um, and I'm going to start off um, by talking about the most common use cases, which most people are focusing on today um, with SBOMs, um, and that's vulnerability uh, detection and vulnerability tracking. Um, and so let's just take a simple example. Uh, here's a vulnerable component, but it has no CPE uh, listed for the actual product you think you own. Okay, so this example is a, um, uh, the software management package for protection relays, uh, substation protection relays. Um, and you can see it's scored here, and you'll notice down here, uh, there's a bunch of known vulnerabilities. Um, now, the interesting thing here is the vulnerabilities are on the components. They're not on the actual product. And so, again, if you go out to the National Vulnerability Database looking for the product you bought, you'll find nothing. For example, here, uh, this is the details and the references, and everything is pointing to Jamalto. So again, this is where the S-bombs are really important because without breaking down that product into its components, you won't know how to search the database. Okay. Um, by the way, if you go back here, it's kind of interesting. Um, even if you look at the S-bomb in its native form and show that, hey, this component is made by SafeNet, you probably remember a second ago that it showed that it was registered against Jamalto, and that's because Jamalto bought SafeNet. So simply uh, even just using the names in an SBOM are not good enough. It has to be enriched with who bought what and, who, and what other names do they trade by. Often we'll find products that have m dozens of vendor names associated to them because of the, the history. Good example is Allen Bradley Products signed by Rockwell uh, and produced by another division. And you'll get all those names in there and you'll have to search for them all. Um, but that's one example. Um, using SBOMs to find out what components are vulnerable on the product you bought. Um, but this is a different example that kind of came up uh, somewhat accidentally for me a little while ago. You see, uh, we have an imaginary company uh, here at uh, Dolus that we call Inatech. Uh, uh, Inatech Energy, to be precise, and um, they, uh, you probably remember Inatech uh, from, from the Office Space movie. And, and Inatech makes, uh, in the imaginary world, uh, stapler firmware for your automated staplers, red staplers in specifically. Um, well, but of course, we're not going to roll software for staplers. So what I do is I tend to download software uh, that I find on the internet, firmware, and I was, and I, it, typically I try to make it current versions of real products, and I happen to be out downloading some firmware and chucking it in here, and we do this as testing all the time. Anyway, one of our new tools is this thing called, um, it's our dashboard to show the product suppliers of the subcomponents. And I was just browsing this the other day, just messing around, and Huawei Technologies shows up. And I go, what the heck? Where did I get Huawei from? <laughs> like. Like, hello, I didn't expect to see this even in an imaginary company. 
So I dug in and I found out it was uh, on some uh, red stapler firmware. Now I know where that red stapler firmware came from. It's from a current version of RTU software actually used in the field today, used by um, some uh, related clients of ours. And so I was like, what the heck? Um, I dug in a little bit more. Um, this Huawei software is clearly being used for um, the um, uh, cellular modems on these products. Um, this may or may not be an issue for you, depending on uh, whether you um, uh, have to be compliant with the uh, um, previous um, executive order, um, 13,000 and change, I can't remember, on, on supply chain for uh, communications industry. Um, but the important thing here is not whether you have to not allow or allow Huawei, but you need to know it's there. Um, it may not actually be active, you may not be using the cellular components, whatever, but if you don't know it's there, you're flying blind. And, and so this is another example of what you can do uh, with these uh, S-bombs and why they're so important. And this is important to the vendors as well. I've, we work with a number of vendors and we found vendors who didn't realize uh, what components their dev teams were stuffing into their products as well. So it's really, really important that we start to get our handle on this or we're just going to be the victim of multiple um, solar winds types of attacks because the bad guys will know that, hey, don't attack directly, attack through a supplier and you'll be under the radar. And that's what we got to fix. By the way, fun little thing, uh, as soon as I did notice that, I immediately went out and generated an S-bomb uh, on this software and went in and, and uh, actually browsed through it and downloaded it and had a look. That's S-bombs aren't fun reading. Uh, this is an SPDX S-bomb. They again are designed to be machine processed. They're not for, uh, they're, they're, they're not intended for manual reading. So at this point, I think it's a good point to start talking about our uh, key takeaways and take a few questions. What do you got? Thanks, guys. Yep. So, you know, thanks, Eric. So again, you know, you need to automate your software collection. Static collection gets old very fast. OT networks change more often than you would expect. If you normalize data collection, it will enable higher level applications and undocumented OT systems have consequences or in our depiction, important things blown up. Yes, and um, you need S-bombs. If you yeah. don't have S-bombs, this is like only collecting half of your data. Um, it's Dale did a really, really good article. Um, Dale Peterson um, did a great article on S-bombs. And you know what S-bombs are, uh, to uh, IT is what asset collection was, you know, four or five years ago. It's really the next step to understand what you really have on your plant floor so you understand your risks, uh, whether it's risks from uh, vulnerabilities, risks from malware, risks from uh, indicators of compromise, uh, or risks from just prohibited vendors. Um, and I, I, with that, I want to point out SBOMs are not just a vulnerability management tool. They're a understand what I got on my plant floor tool. Yeah. Um, Last thing I want to talk about is on their own, an S-bomb is misery. It's it's like the can of soup, and you're staring at a bunch of chemical names, and you don't know if they're good or bad. Um, you have to uh, use uh, data science to enrich those and really tie them back to uh, a, a tool like Industrial Defenders uh, ASM to really make sense of how the S-bombs impact your environment. Uh, pages and pages of S-bombs really don't help people much. Yeah. So you have to enrich them. So at this point, what do you think, guys? Shall we go to questions? Any last thoughts? Let's right, go to questions. Um, so one of the questions we just got asked was, uh, SBOM transparency side effect. Uh, this, uh, will folks discover their vendors were improperly using open source and I'll, I'll probably ad lib in or anybody's third party software without real regard to the licensing requirements? So, so are you, inadvertently exposing yourself to license risk uh, with S-bombs. <laughs> you know that, I'll, I'll answer that one. That's a really good question because um, the one of the formats of uh, S-bombs weren't for vulnerability management. They were originally created uh, SPDX for licensing management and to be able to solve the licensing problem in open source. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, there is a risk there. Um, but the problem is, is that if if we don't sort of put it out openly, then it's trivial for me as an analyst or a bad guy to just dig around and find the same thing myself. This is just, you know, obscurity, uh, security through obscurity is a really bad plan. 
It's better to just say, hey, this is what's there. Uh, is it right? If not, clean it up. But yeah, absolutely. There may be some vendors who get some egg on their face and I hope uh, they do the right thing and clean it up. But they're probably going to get the egg in the face anyway, if this is going to be a nicer way of getting it. Yeah, I'd say probably the bigger vendors in the last, like maybe even decade, it's probably not an over big worry for them because I know we had really good, uh, my former employer, we had really good licensing management and software code library kind of acknowledgement that way. Nothing nothing got put in without legal. Um, but I think, you know, once you start going past older than a decade, which many ICS systems are, yeah, it's probably a real, a real risk, right? So, yeah. And, and this is why I think the first people who should generate the S-bombs are the vendors, so they know what they're actually shipping to their customers. And then they understand the risk they're dealing with. Um, even if they generate their own S-bombs and they sort of keep them to themselves, hey, that's that's probably not ideal, but it's better than just uh, sticking your head in the sand like a like a, the famous ostrich. Yeah. All right, Adolis and ASM integration diagram, can it be shared? You guys wanna talk a little bit about any integration plans? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Industrial Defender uh, continues to engage partners and we continue to look at what the market requires, our users are requiring for said services. So we've, we've enhanced the ASM to do vulnerability monitoring and management. We've enhanced it with partners to do patch management. And now the next step is obviously taking the software inventory and OTS information we collect and being able to integrate with the SBOM. So, uh, you know, it's in our roadmap and we will provide an announcement on when the, the product is finalized. Yeah, and I'll say that my dev team has been working with uh, George and Jeremy's dev team pretty hard uh, to be able to come up with a really nice design that works across uh, uh, boundaries and all the things that we have to deal with in nursing. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, because you guys, you guys are, yeah, yeah, we have different operate, like we're very much on premise and you guys are, are a little very more up in the cloud. Yeah, but yeah. I think we have a really cool design to deal with that, to uh, uh, allow uh, cloud to talk to uh, uh, um, inside perimeter. So, uh, yeah, and you I, I and, yeah. and Jeremy, you know that we basically do a great job of obfuscating all of the uh, NERC SIP data when yep. we share out the, our software inventory. So we have mechanisms in place to obfuscate the data for NERC SIP and enable in order to enable these higher level applications to uh, yep. to be integrated into the Industrial Defender ASM. Yeah. Yep. All right. And then uh, another question we just got in was, uh, how do you all envision SBOM data being distributed and maintained? with a software version alongside a binary and MD5 file packaged in the docs, third-party database of software version and SBOM other. Wow, who wants to tackle yeah. that one? <laughs> well, I, I'm gonna actually add to, actually I'll probably add to it. I think the other big thing is, is uh, when you look at DCS projects, they're often very project-based, right? So you go to one DCS made by the vendor within three months of another site, for another customer and they're they're totally different right like those s-bombs are going to be probably different and not not maybe insignificantly right like i mean that's the nature of these big large industrial scale projects um yeah uh, you know th this is why i got interested in s-bombs is because you end up holding two packages that are supposed to be you know pretty much identical from from uh, an OEM, <clears throat> and I'll confess that happened with us at Tofino too. You'd think, oh, these are two identical, and when you tear them down, there's there's uh, subtle but important differences in the packaging. And so one of the things that I've been working with my team is building this big graph database that when you have a hash of, uh, or an MD5 or, a, or preferably a SHA of an, a full installer, we can uh, help you understand all its components and what's what's um, different and what's changed, so that you can be very very specific to uh, you know a very specific deployment. You know this is what was installed on this plant. Oh, I guess we haven't answered the question yet though. Uh, the question <laughs> is how do you distribute the S bombs? So that's a very good question uh, because it, it's absolutely up in the air. There's a whole yeah. open source community thinks that S bombs should just be you know, put up there on uh, on um, the vendor's websites, uh, completely open. Um, I'm a little nervous about that. I think that not everybody needs to see it. Um, so when we're working with a vendor, 
Uh, we typically uh, let them decide how they want to distribute the SBOMs. Um, and when we're working with an end user like, or a, a partner like um, somebody like uh, uh, Industrial Defender here, what we're usually doing is saying, hey, give us some evidence that you actually have the package. Give us the MD5 or the hash. Give us, give us a copy of the package. Give us something that shows that you actually have reason to need this SBOM. And not just, hey, I'd like to go and see what my competitors are doing. I'm just gonna go browsing their, their catalog. So I, I think that there is uh, reasonable in our space to say, let's have some controls. Um, and one of the things we've been building for one of our partners is uh, uh, a portal just for their clients to be able to go and get the SBOMs for their product lines. So these are all possibilities. I think we're, we're still in the early stages. But I think the thing to remember is, again, I'll go back to that question about, uh, or that, that statement, um, obscurity is, is, is not a great solution for obscurity. Um, if just because you don't hand out an SBOM for a product doesn't mean that a good reverse engineer can't build one uh, in pretty quick order. Um, so you're not protecting yourself from the bad guys by not handing out SBOMs. And then another question just came in. Do you think there are any nerd SIP requirements that are impacted by having SBOMs? If so, which ones? Boy, who wants to tackle that one? Well, I mean, I think the first one that comes up to my mind is like SIP 10 baselines, right? Like at yeah. what level? Traditionally, we've gone with what's in ad remove programs by Windows, right? Yeah. Like, and then, but there's always been that outlier or custom software, right? Or, right. So I think one of the big questions is going to be is how is NERT going to interpret a full blown S bomb? And is that the answer for SIP 10 software title, like software baseline listing? Um, that'll be really interesting if that's the direction they go in, any, especially anytime soon. Um, I think, uh, you know, and then, I don't know, they, you know, SIP, tip, SIP 13. 13. Kind of relation. So we're saying, so basically the question is, does the SIP 13 or the supply chain or the SBOM issue, does that impact the definition of NERC SIP 10 in the baselines? Yeah, well, or any standards yeah. that are impacted. Yeah, or any standard, yeah. But I think, I think yeah. it's those two, right? Like, yeah. I mean. Yep. Yeah, um, and I think that anybody out there that is doing federal supply is going to get, uh, okay, this is a spoiler alert, uh, and, and some of you guys have already read this and already heard this, but um, it's pretty obvious that there's going to be an executive order coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks demanding SBOMs for anybody doing uh, federal supply. So, you know, it's, 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 it's here. Um, that's probably the worst kept secret in, in the Beltway right now. Yep. All right, I don't, oh no, another one came in. All right, to that point, are you also offering SBOM discovery services to some clients answering the, what do I have in here use case? Yeah, absolutely, that's the object of the exercise. Uh, if somebody, if you're a vendor, um, or if you're um, a, a tool provider like um, Industrial Defender, or if you're an end user, we'll be happy to tear software apart and give you SBOMs. And um, honestly, I think the best way to do it, I mean, we're happy to work directly, but I think you get better bang for your buck working with Industrial Defender and having uh, them build your asset list and then feed us the information so we can build all the asset SBOMs yeah. specifically for your asset list. It's just, to me, it seems more efficient, but we'll generate SBOMs for anybody who wants to give us software to do it. And I, we're, there's no law that says we have to do SBOMs just for uh, the guy who wrote it. As much as some vendors would like to believe that, but that's not the way the world works. All right, uh, I'll let it stay open for about 10 more seconds for anyone who wants to get one more question in. Um, while we're waiting, uh, I'd just like to point out that there are five handouts available to you directly within the control panel uh, for the meeting. So there's a solutions brief and some other guides um, that you don't have to go through the uh, website to get they're available directly here in the uh in the webcast yeah and and i'd like to point out you know i just want to really give a hand up, or a, a shout out to industrial defender you know they, this whole relationship started with us analyzing their software not building tools or anything just helping them make sure that their software um was uh you know really well done and so it's been a real pleasure and and i'm seeing that across the industry um, you know, most of the vendors, in fact, I'd say 99% of the vendors we talk to 
uh, really see SBOMs as something that is not just a have to do, but something that will actually help them help you. Oh, some some very complimentary things at the very end. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it, everyone. Yep. Thanks. Eric, thank you. Thank you to the audience for hanging in there with us. We really appreciate it. This was a great conversation. Yep. All right. And this uh, these slides and uh, video will be available, and feel free to reach out to us. Thanks, everybody, and may the fourth be with you. May the fourth be with you, everyone. Bye, y'all.